You doing good? How was your week? Do we have a good week? Awesome. All right, uh, so we are entering the book of John, and uh, you're going to want to take notes. We're going to be in John for a long time. There's going to be a lot of fun, cool stuff that we learn about in John. Uh, and so get excited about it. Are you excited? I'm kind of excited. All right. Uh, so, but as we begin the book of John today, we need to realize that it's going to be slow going for a while. Very slow going. Uh, it might take us a while to get through chapter 1. Today, I will be preaching on John chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to squeeze in verse 2. Just because. So, <laughs> there's so much theology in those two verses. In fact, uh, the reason that we're only going to get two verses done is because like Paul, John gives us this huge theological stake right off the bat, very first phrase in, in his gospel. And it's so filling and so robust that if we don't take time to digest it properly, we're not going to be able to enjoy the rest of the meal. There's things that he says right away that, uh, that he develops this theology that if we don't grasp it right, if we read the rest of the book, we're going to miss so much. We have to get the right framework as we're, we're entering in to this great book. All right, so let's take a deep breath. Are you ready? Verse 1. Chapter 1. Or chapter 1, verse 1. All right, here it goes. John starts his gospel by saying, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That's all we're going to get to today. <laughs> and really, I've toned it down. I had a three-hour sermon planned out. And uh, I, was, you know, I didn't want to be like uh, that guy in the upper room that fell out of the window because we preached too long and he fell out and I'd have to resurrect you from the dead and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's move forward. So what is this word? He uses it three times. Do you know whenever something is emphasized more than once in the Bible, it really means that you need to focus on whatever is being said. Okay? And so he uses the word three times. And this word is, well, it's, it's word. The word is word. Okay? Uh, but in the Greek, we can call it Logos. And Logos is one of the most theologically heavy words that you need to understand. And that's why we're going to take time to make sure that you understand Logos, or Logos, so that as we're reading it and we come across it in different ways, we know what's happening and what's going on. All right. So the Logos... Uh, is given four different things here in the beginning of this chapter. And we need to realize uh, that John here is the very best guy to be able to you know, tell us about this. Now, if your glasses are fogging up because the carpet is cleaning, we have an anti-fog cloth up here that it, it works. I've got it on, I'm not foggy. So if you want to borrow it and see, you can do that. Okay? All right. Uh, so, the first thing, the Word, or the Logos, was present at creation. So if you want to write that down in your notes, these four things. The Logos was present at creation. John starts his Gospel with a very familiar phrase. This phrase is intended to bring you back to something else that you already knew and understood. Uh, it's really amazing how our minds work. Uh, I'm going to play a little game with you, and I'm going to say a short phrase, and you're going to tell me where your mind takes you. Are you ready? Okay. All right. We're going to see. I think the kids can get some of these, too. All right. Here it goes. We have the meat. Arby's. Arby's! <laughs> Right? That was just a weird phrase, right? But you got it. All right. 
Here's another one. Eat more chicken. Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, all right. <laughs> This one's a little, a little tougher, a little, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty. Oh, bounty. Oh, the moms knew that one. Okay, and when that commercial goes on, the kids are just like, ooh. All right. Taste the rainbow. Skittles. Skittles. All right. See, these are really good at this. Okay. Oh, this one's tough. What can Brown do for you? UPS. UPS. <laughs> what? Isn't it crazy how many little tiny phrases are programmed into your mind? Yeah. Right? Alright, here's another one. Uh, this, oh, this one's a scripture one. Okay, you got to give me the scripture. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16. Look at that. You guys almost all know that. It's amazing. Alright? Okay, I got one hard one for you. Alright, it's scripture. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'll give you a hint. It didn't originate in the New Testament. I know. Is it a psalm or a proper? It's a psalm. It's a psalm. It's a psalm. Is it um, 23? Oh, close. Close. 25? No. <laughs> 22. Too older. 22. Ah, yes. Oh, oh, close. 22. Psalm 22. Jesus is dying on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's supposed to bring you to... Psalm 22, chapter? which describes the crucifixion before crucifixion was ever realized. I think it was that part by the God. All right. Okay, all right, but we can't go off that rabbit hole too much. We're, we're learning about Logos today. All right, so what is John trying to remind us of by using the phrase, in the beginning? What's he trying to do? What do you think? Remind you about the stars? What? About the stars? The start. Oh, the start. Yeah, the start of what? Life. The start of life? Things. Planet. What? Didn't I hear a scripture that had something like that already? The beginning. Yeah, in the very beginning, right? The very first book of the Bible, first couple words. What does it say? Genesis 1-1. In the beginning. Do you think he knew that? In the beginning. <laughs> you know, the Old Testament was already kind of around then, right? So he took the very first phrase in, in the Pentateuch, is what they called it back then, and he used it to start his gospel. Do you think he's going somewhere theologically with that? Yes. I think so. That's why he called it. All right. <laughs> so, in the beginning, God, verse... In the beginning, word, or logos. Whew. The point here is that John is not trying to contrast these two phrases. Rather, he is trying to say that they are the same phrase. John wants to make sure that the term God and logos, or logos, becomes intimately linked. Where you can't talk about Logos without God, and you can't talk about God without Logos. It is this term, the Word. Mm. So how bold of a statement was it to say that there was something before creation that was sitting around with God in the beginning? Does that sound crazy? Yeah, one down. <laughs> but really, it's, it's really not that crazy. Do you know that in Genesis 1, verse 2, we see that there's somebody else in the creation story before the world was created? Okay? It says this. In, uh, scripture says in Genesis 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So here we have, in the beginning, we have God, and we have the Holy Spirit. And an ice cream truck. <laughs> Alright, stay focused. 
All right. So now we need to realize here that John is telling us that we should be able to find this word actually within the creation story itself. Remember, he's in the New Testament. He's, we know he's going to be talking about Jesus, right? Okay, but he's saying this logos is with God in the beginning. Okay? So how did God do it? How could God camouflage the word or logos of God in a way that would be hidden from men for thousands of years and yet reveal it to those who've had their eyes and ears opened by the Spirit of God after Christ's ascension? I mean, can you imagine that uh, the high priests uh, and Moses, uh, they were all talking to God and they had no idea that this logos was right there. They were introduced right in the beginning of creation. And you see, this is important because in the next couple weeks, when we get further into John, John makes some very serious claims that if we can't believe this right away, we're not going to be able to believe what he says next in verse 3 and 4. Okay? All right. So, but I want you to hold that thought. The second part of Logos that we find in creation is this. The Word is shown to have an extremely intimate relationship with God. Alright? I know some of you guys are taking notes. So, the second one. The Word is shown to have an extremely intimate relationship with God. Now, I have 3,500 Facebook friends a week, right? <laughs> Do I have an intimate relationship with 3,500 people on Facebook? No. I mean, they're really kind of acquaintances. In fact, some I don't think I've ever met. I may never meet in my whole life. Okay? Uh, so they're, they're, he's not talking about this. What he's talking about here is that this word and God have a very, very special very intimate relationship. Now you and I know that John is talking about Jesus at this time. Therefore, we should be able to find some scriptures that reveal just how close God and Jesus are somewhere in the rest of the New Testament, right? If they're tight like this, we should be able to see it. So if you could, turn to John chapter 5. We're going to stay in the same book. If you want to know about God and Jesus' relationship, you just read the book of John. Because it is thick. So John, chapter 5. We're going to be in verse 19. And as we read this, I want you to comprehend this closeness that's going on in this relationship. So verse 19 says this. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father do. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. All right? Now, uh, me and my children are very close, right? We have an intimate relationship. So if I go to church on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, okay, most likely they are coming with me, amen? Okay? Uh, so there's this intimacy, there's this oneness where, where God is going, Jesus is going with. Uh, now flip back to John 14, a little bit back farther, and this is verse 10. So John 14, verse 10. All right, he says this. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. I mean... Yeah. Can you just picture that intimacy that he's talking about? Where Jesus is in God and God is in Jesus. 
It, it's this, this fellowship, this unity. Here in these two scriptures, we can see that Jesus is not only guided in what to say and do by watching and imitating the Father, he uses a familiar phrase to show that intimacy. Just as we are to be in Christ, do you know that that's what Jesus wants us to do? Later on in John, he kind of shifts to us, and he says, I want you to be in Christ, or to abide in Christ, or to remain in Christ. And it's the same language Right now, he's using it with Jesus and God. Now, there's a, a, an easy way to illustrate this. Whoever has played with nesting eggs before? You know what nesting eggs are? <coughs> I got a picture of them, if my thing lets me. <coughs> Shazam! No. <laughs> Whoa, I almost put it right there. Okay. Has ever, anyone ever seen nesting eggs before? Or nesting dolls? Okay, uh, they're very interesting, right? Uh, because um, it comes in like this one little big doll here. Uh, and all the little ones fit inside the next one all the way up. So when you're playing with them, you can either have just the one big doll and everyone's hiding in it. Okay, or you can kind of open them all up and pull them all out and, and line them up on your shelf. <clears throat> now, the intimacy that we're describing here, and this is the cool part, is that God is like this big nesting dog. Right? And if you were to open him up, if you were to open up God, in the very center of who he is, in the very center of his will, you would find who? Jesus. He's just in there. He's in the center. And so they're, they're one. They're, they're, there's intimacy. Where do you think that we are supposed to be? In Jesus. We're supposed to be in Jesus. And so, and here's the, here's the really cool part. If you are in Jesus, that means you are in God. Does that make sense? Because Jesus is in God. And so we have this opportunity now in the New Testament to share that intimacy that Jesus has with God by being in Christ. All right. So not only uh, is the Logos in, at the beginning of creation, but it is also intimately linked. And now we get to the third part. The third part is the Word is actually God. So it's almost like a crescendo is being built here. John first says, hey guys, this Logos was in the beginning, but then he like shrinks in the microscope and he says, oh, let's look at further. It's not only in the beginning, this Logos has a very intimate relationship with God. And now he's zooming in even more on this microscope. And now he's saying, oh, by the way, this Logos is actually God. All right. Okay. Now, I'm not just staring at you all the time. You're just right in the middle. So don't think I'm just like staring you down. You didn't do anything wrong. I'm all yeah, you're not funny looking or anything. Just right in the middle. So. At least something different this week. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, I think the authority of a bold claim like that should be backed up not only by Scripture, but backed up by Jesus' own words. Amen? Uh, if, if I'm going to say, hey, this Logos, this Jesus actually is God, I want it to come from God's mouth himself. All right? Therefore... If you want to turn in your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 10. Verse 30, so towards the end. John chapter 10, verse 30. And we can hear what Jesus says about this concept. All right. Uh, he 
he's speaking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees aren't very happy with him. And this is what he says. He likes to make the Pharisees a little mad. Uh, he, he tries not to be nice. Like, he doesn't cut corners. He's like, this is the truth. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay? All right, this is what he says. Speaking to the Pharisees, he says, I and the Father are one. Whew, that is a bold statement. And, he go, and this is what happens. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Then Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which one of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Okay, so, and, and here's, uh, so we have Jesus' words, and just in case uh, we don't get it, we also get the Pharisees responding and stating the same accusation. Does that make sense? So basically, Jesus said it, and now the Pharisees said, this is what you said. Okay, so we get it twice. So now Jesus gets to come back and clarify, just to make sure you know, that they heard him right. So Jesus answered them, has it not been written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. All right? So he didn't back down. He basically said, I am God. All right? And that's super important for us to grasp. Because you've got to remember, John is writing to a group of people who are starting to develop their theology as Christians. And they were basically saying God, or that Jesus was either fully God, where he was a phantom walking around without leaving any footprints, and he was a ghost that walked through walls, or he was a man, and he didn't have any godly powers at all, and he was just a really good teacher. And that's what was happening. And so Paul is, or John is really making sure. He's like, Jesus said that he is God. You need to get this. All right. So he makes it plain. I and the Father are one. So the real question is that we have is how can Jesus be one with God if he's a separate person? Now that, even for the strongest theologians, is a really hard one, right? Uh, and the reason is because it's a mystery. We don't really get to understand the fullness of God until we get to see him face to face. In fact, there's so many questions that, that we have that we wish we could get answered. Uh, do you guys find that? Uh, you know, like, I don't know, <laughs> like, what's heaven going to be like? You know? I mean, that's a great question, but we're not going to know that until we get to heaven. And the say, oh, yes. Well, again, God say, I'm not going to give you all the answers right now. That's right. Yeah, and so he's giving us just enough to be able to believe. And so here we have this mystery that, that, that Jesus is claiming to be God, yet he's a physical person, and God is spirit. And so, yeah, so we've got to learn about this. Uh, to understand that, we need to realize that Jesus was not created. And I, and I think this is super important. Okay, most of you are a child, you need to know that Jesus was not created. Okay? Uh, when he was uh, brought out through uh, the Virgin Mary, he was not created through Mary. He was created before that. That's just when he came into the world uh, and was fathered uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, instead, Jesus was actually begotten. Okay, uh, is it John 3, 16? Uh, For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave his one and begotten son. Begotten son, right? Okay, you see, God created man, and man begets or bring forth sons and daughters. But God was never created, 
And if Jesus is God, that means Jesus was never created either. I know, right? This is important stuff. we got to grasp this. All right. His brain is starting to overpower. You need to go outside and fan yourself off a little bit. All right. Okay, we're going to get through this. Okay, this is an important question. Was Jesus created? Whew. That's a tough one. All right. In fact, somewhere it says he's the firstborn of creation, but uh, the firstborn title didn't actually mean like physically born. It meant just like head of the head of the children type of thing. But uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Did you know that God provides a beautiful picture of what it looked like to beget his one and only son, Jesus? Did you know that? He actually gives us a picture. And so we're going to talk about that today. So if you didn't know how Jesus was begotten, you're going to. All right. So this is, this is fun. We find the imagery in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, we find out how Eve was made. Was Eve born of natural man-created kind of ways? No. No, right? There was a different way. In fact, she was the only human being that was ever brought forth or begotten that was not the way that the rest of us were. Okay? What? Oh, yeah. Well, Adam was, yeah, that's right. Adam was, yes. She was the second. Yep. All right. So Eve was not begotten the way the rest of us were begotten. Listen to the oneness of intimacy that describes how Eve was begotten of Adam. Yes. Uh, didn't Adam take, uh, God take his word out? Oh, that's good. All right. You got it. We're going to read it, though. Okay, so Genesis chapter 2, this is 20 through 23. And for some of you reading this uh, right now, this may be the first time that you're, you're picturing Jesus being brought forth uh, through this scripture. I, I don't hear this sermon very often. Uh, but here we go. For Adam, this is kind of in the second part of 20, for Adam there was no helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And, and check this out. The man says, this is the theology part, at last... This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Not someone else's flesh. Flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Ha, oh, man, that is deep. How can Jesus be God and yet be physically a person? We don't get to know all the answers. <laughs> but this provides a beautiful picture. You see, we have to wrap our heads around the idea that God is not just a simple spirit hanging out somewhere in outer space. Okay? When we're growing up, we kind of feel like that. You know, the thunder rolls over like, oh, God's over here. Oh, man, he's mad at somebody. Right? Okay? <laughs> no, I mean, he's... Do you know that God is in every place at every moment that he wants to be? He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. Yes? I was told when I was little in Manhattan that he dropped a bag of potatoes. He dropped... Or that he was bowling. Yeah. The angels are bowling. Or something. He just dropped something. He just dropped something. Yeah. Yes. See, our parents are smart. They've got it. <laughs> but God is everywhere all the time. Isn't that cool? So, can you run away from God? 
You really can't. I've tried to run away from God. I don't know if you've ever tried to run away from God. I actually thought I could get on a boat in the ocean and run away from God. But I didn't read uh, Jonah. <laughs> right? Anyway, so that didn't work. Um, but here, so we have to understand this, what God is more like. Picture God, because uh, we have to put him in some kind of space just to, to think about him. Uh, but picture him as a ball. He's just a big ball. Okay? He doesn't have a foot. He doesn't have a head. And he's super massive. Okay? I think he likes the whole galaxy. Who knows? Okay? Um, no part of him is lesser than the other parts. Does that make sense? Like my son Landon, he's got some lesser parts that uh, <laughs> so, uh, kind of take a shower, please. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just read a post on Facebook that said 37% of your sermon illustrations come from your children. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> but anyway, so, so God is this big ball. Just picture him as this big ball. And he doesn't have any bad parts. He's holy over here. He's holy in the middle. He's holy everywhere. He's the same. He's exactly the same. There's no head. There's no foot. Does that make sense? Now listen to this imagery of what happens when Jesus is begotten of the Father. This is what I think really happened. At the very beginning of time, Whenever that was, at the beginning, in the beginning, God loved us. It's his nature. His, the core of his nature is holy and love and blessed. And, and love is an action. It has, to, it has to go somewhere. It can't sit still. And so the very first act of creation is God reaches deep into himself. And he's a ball. And every part of him is the same. He reaches deep into himself and he just pulls out himself. And it's manifested. It's begotten. It's the same. And it manifested itself as Jesus. Does that mean that Jesus was created? No, I, in science, that's more like he, he just multiplied. It's the same. It, okay, does that make sense? So he's, he's different, but he's the same. All right, in fact, when, when we read that bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, oh, I mean, it's so, it, it's so pretty. Um, Jesus is spirit of God's spirit and logos of God's logos. He's the same. He's intimate. And they are one, yet separate at the same time. It is no surprise that John emphasizes the deity of Christ as he writes in verse 2. So here, we graduated to verse 2. Congratulations. Alright. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, we got that. And the Word was with God. Had a super close relationship. And the Word was God. Whoa, this is getting kind of weird. And now John says in verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. Now, like I said, we have already know the answer. He's talking about Jesus. But here, it's written for the readers to start to figure out. John wants his readers to know that this <laughs> Logos, or Word of God, is actually a physical Man. Oh, we're on the last page now, so good. Alright. <laughs> Alright, so are you ready? This is good stuff. Before, I told you that we were going to get back to finding the logos in the creation story. I'm telling you, this is good stuff. Are you ready for this? I hope you're taking notes. If you're going to forget like 45% of this. Now let me ask a question. Does God make mistakes? No. Not really, right? He knows what he's doing, right? He's got a pretty good head on his shoulders. 
metaphorically ball speaking, right? Okay. <laughs> oh man. Do you think it was God that walked past Moses? No, it was Jesus. God is spirit. Oh, we'll get to that later. <laughs> All right. Does God make mistakes? And yet we seem to find one in the creation story. Turn with me to Genesis 1, chapter 14. Verse 14. Genesis 1, chapter, verse 14. We find the mistake. To separate the day and the night. And they shall serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. And they shall serve as lights in the expanse of the heavens. To give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day and the lesser to govern the night. He also made the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning on the what day? Fourth day. Fourth day. Oh, this is exciting stuff. Oh, man. Are you ready for this? Yeah, you are. <laughs> so, fourth day, he creates light. If God is perfect and does not make a mistake, then why does he create light twice? Hmm? You see, on the fourth day, God creates, created the lights. But the crazy thing is, is God already spent an entire day, not part of the day, he spent an entire day creating light already. Why in the world would God spend two different days creating the same thing? Was he not good enough the first time? Didn't like it? Scrunched that up? Threw it away? Okay. Sunset needs to look different. No. All right. To understand this best, we need to read one of the great I am statements found in John, where Jesus makes seven statements that says, I am this. And we know that phrase, I am, is something that only God says. I am the I am. Okay? And now Jesus says, I am. So turn to John chapter 8. Some of you already know where I'm going now. <clears throat> John chapter 8, verse 12. And Jesus says this. Then Jesus spoke again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, you think that was a metaphor? Yes. All throughout Scripture, light has been given as a characteristic and aspect of God's holiness. It talks about the separation of light and darkness. So here, here's the question. How does God, okay, you remember, Jesus had to come and die on a cross. If right away in creation, God said, hey, I am here. There's my Holy Spirit. And there is Jesus Christ, who is going to be born in Nazareth on this day. 
you think that the Pharisees would have crucified him on a cross? No, they wouldn't have. Right? Like, if God really wanted to be known, he would have been known, and everyone would have figured it out. But uh, Jesus actually says that he, he covered the eyes of the people so that they couldn't see, that they couldn't understand. And see, that's the way God did it here in the scriptures right away. So how does God camouflage a Savior that's always been, yet was not seen until the New Testament? He calls him by his nature instead of by his name. Does that make sense? So are you ready to find Jesus in the creation story? Oh, this is great. <laughs> oh, this is going to knock your socks out of here. Whew. All right, let's do this. Turn your Bibles to the very first page. <laughs> yes, chapter 1, verse 1. Right away. We're not going to wait. Here we go. Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be mind-blowing if the first three verses in the Bible explained the Trinity right off the bat, saying, hey, welcome, I am God. <laughs> we already know verse 1, right? What's verse 1? All right, in the beginning, God created. And who wants to read verse 2 again? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was hovering over the world. The waters, right? So we have God. We've got the Holy Spirit. Are you ready? Verse 3. It says this. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God didn't make a mistake. He didn't create light twice. He was simply introducing himself to the world in a way that would remain hidden until the chosen time. Jesus, I want you to leave here knowing this today, Jesus is the Logos of God. Amen? John doesn't want to wait around for us to make our own conclusions about Jesus in his gospel. Right away, John reveals this concept of logos, or word of God. John wants us to realize that in the fullness of God's holiness, remember, God's just like this big ball. He's holy all around. He's all the same. Okay, Jesus has been begotten, brought forth from him. He's not separate. He's just separated a little bit in some mysterious way that we don't get to understand, but it's all wrapped up in this same term, Logos. And so whenever you hear the Word of God, you have to be able to understand that it is this full nature of God. Hmm. Next week, we're going to be talking a little bit about how all Scripture is god breath. That scripture is the word of God. It's going to be a good one. All right. The Logos was not only with God in the beginning. This Logos or nature of God's holiness was begotten or brought forth and it manifested itself as a man that we call Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, and Lord, I know that there are people here that have never heard this message. And Lord, we haven't heard these messages because we don't have men of faith that are willing to listen to the Holy Spirit and to be open, to be able to go into your word and realize that it's a living word. And so Lord, whatever we preach here today or in the future, 
Help it not come from me as a pastor. Help it to come from you because you are the God that teaches us all things. And so, Lord, if we are mistaken in some way, help to sharpen each other. Help us not to bicker or complain. But, Lord, you have given us a great truth today, and it matches your word. It doesn't go against your word. And it says in the last times before the end that you are going to, to reveal yourself in a more intimate way with your church. And so, Lord, we look around us and we see what's happening in the world. And Lord, the church is going to be going through a, a time of harsh persecution. But wouldn't it be sweet? Wouldn't there be just a little more hope? If what, what has been just, just checking off a box on Sunday morning can become a time of, of, of being fed by you, the living bread, the bread of life. Where we come and we don't come and get the same, uh, same thing over and over again. But you come and you give us a message of your intimacy and your, the depths of your fullness. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to be with us. Lord, I feel you here today. And we thank you for that. We thank you that, that even though the carpets are, are wet and, and our glasses are fogging up and we're hot and sweaty, that you are still able to come here and teach us about yourself. And so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.